During the early years of the Depression, when I was crossing the Atlantic, I fell into conversation with a fellow passenger. She was a gracious white-haired woman. She said that since she had lost a great deal of her money because of bank failures and bad stock investments, she was now going to buy herself something nobody could take away from her. She was going to Athens to see the Acropolis and the Parthenon. She knew what too few persons know, the difference between an investment in physical things that are perishable and an investment in something that is imperishable because it enriches personal life, becoming a part of one's very self. But the incident has another face, a face which has a real bearing on the cause which has brought us here together this evening. It was the art of Greece which was taking this woman on our pilgrimage, just as cathedrals and public buildings, paintings, statues, and literatures of Europe have taken countless thousands of Americans there. The art, the vision of which was an enrichment of our personal life, is also that which has given Greece her enduring glory among nations. Material acquisitions and possessions have never given any people a sure place in the memory of mankind or in history. It is by creation of the intangibles of science and philosophy, especially of the fine arts, that countries and communities have won immortality for themselves after material wealth had crumbled into dust. What's been true of other people's will be true of our own. Creation, not acquisition, is the measure of a nation's rank. It is the only road to an enduring place in the memory of mankind. Now there's a good reason why achievement in science and art is the criterion by which a nation's place in civilization is finally judged. In the case of material things, possession by one excludes possession, use and enjoyment by others. In the case of the things of art, the exact opposite is the case. The more the arts flourish, the more they belong to all persons alike, without regard to wealth, birth, race, or creed. The more they flourish, the less they are privately owned, the more they are possessed, and enjoyed by all. This is what we mean when we say art is universal, more universal than science, for the arts speak a language which is close to the emotions, the imagination of every man. Accordingly, whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, the question whether this country of ours is to be narrow and provincial or whether it is to attain to that which is universal, will be finally decided by what we do, what we are capable of appreciating and enjoying in those things of which the fine arts are outstanding examples. It is on this account that I esteem deeply and greatly the opportunity to be here this evening and to express as best I can not only gratitude as a citizen to Edward Bruce for initiating and conducting the section of fine arts in the Public Buildings Administration, Federal Works Agency, but also my sense of the great significance of this work in the development of a worthy American civilization. For the work done is significant both as a symbol and as an actual force in inspiring and directing activities that as time goes on will extend far beyond what it's now doing in post offices and other public buildings. As a symbol, this work is an acknowledgement from official sources with active encouragement of persons high in the government of the importance to our nation of the development of art and ability to enjoy art projects. Ned Bruce showed me a letter from the postmaster of one of the smaller towns 
where the post office now has a mural on its walls. In his letter of enthusiastic thanks for what has been done for his town, he includes a sentence that might almost be a motto of the whole project. How can a finished citizen be made in an artless town? How indeed can an all-round and complete citizenry be developed without creation and enjoyment of works of art, one to which the government itself must contribute? Our public buildings may become the outward and visible sign of an inward grace which is the democratic spirit. But now, too often, in our municipal halls and county courthouses, these buildings are not even kept clean. As a symbol, the work carried on by the section of fine arts is a service to democracy so important, even in its present limited scale, that to starve it or allow it to lapse would be a defeat for democracy as genuine as one taking place on a physical battlefield. For the same reason, this governmental activity is more than a symbol. Hundreds of thousands of persons all over this broad land now have opportunities to see and enjoy works of art which they have not had before. They are developing within themselves germs that were part of their being, but that hadn't had a chance to grow. If our arts come forth from the museums to which they have retired, if they become a living part of the walk and conversation of the average man and part of the heritage of a democratic people, a great debt will be owed to the stimulus provided by this governmental section in the buildings which belong to the common people where they daily assemble. Old world countries have developed the fine arts by means of patronage of the nobility and the wealthy. But their healthy development in our country will depend upon the active response of the civic consciousness of the common people. For this reason, I do not want to close without mentioning a fact which I could bring home to you only if television were at my command. For if you could see for yourself reproductions of the murals now found in public buildings from Maine to the Gulf, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, you would see that the paintings combine the value of the arts which nourish the human spirit with those accomplishments of our past history which strengthen the legitimate pride which enables one to say, I am an American citizen.